Welcome to Audio Branding, the hidden gem of marketing. Sound plays a more important role in human behavior and our decision-making than you may realize. In this podcast, I'll help you understand the art and science of sound so you can better influence others in business and your life. I'm your host, Jody Krangle. Let's delve a little deeper. Thank you so much for being here, Steve. I really appreciate it. And oh, it's you're welcome. It's been a while. <laughs> I know. I know. But I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm happy to support and, uh, you know, to let you pick whatever's left of my brain. It's, uh, <laughs> There's it's a lot a, going on in there. Always a pleasure. I can tell. Yeah, well, yeah I know. That's the, that's the problem. <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe we'll get some of it out today. <laughs> yeah. We'll, 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 we'll see try. what happens. We'll try. Yeah. Anyway. yeah. Well, uh, the first thing that I always ask people is if they have an early memory of how sound moved them. So do you have one of those? Yes, I do, actually. Um, and it's uh, it's it maybe is not how it moved me at the time, but how over time it's okay. it's it's moved me. Um, I grew up in a little a couple of little mining towns uh, in rural West Virginia. And so uh, coal was mined and trains would haul the coal back and forth. Uh, and so as a child, I heard the trains always um, in the background and the train whistles. Uh, and one of the things that I found out from talking to one of the engineers was that there were patterns in the whistles, almost like Morse code, uh, that were used to signal if they were coming up to an intersection uh, and each of the conductors kind of had their own way of, uh, of using that whistle. So there was a personality in that. And so as a kid, that was just fascinating to me. And now as an adult to this day, whenever I hear a train whistle, it takes me right back to my childhood, it's just that powerful of a of uh, a, a memory trigger, um, oh, and it. and so it, it it appealed to the the nerdy part of me uh, as as a kid, and it still does today. That's fantastic. Did you ever discover like who the conductors were and what they were trying to say? <laughs> um, there was there was one uh, one engineer that. I knew uh, that lived in town um, and was a friend of the family. So he was the one that kind of hipped me to all of this. But, you know, the, so cool. boop, 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 boop. that was the signal for we're approaching an intersection oh, and how okay. and, and and in a lot of these engines where at that point in time, it wasn't just a. Um, a button that you pushed that gave the one signal. It was really you know, how you leaned into producing the sound. So you could shorten or lengthen, you know, adjust the volume depending, particularly if, it, if there was steam involved in that whistle. Mm -hmm. So there is a way to play it like you play, would play an instrument. And that's yeah. what gave it the personality. That is so interesting. I never thought of that, that they were actually trying to say a message of a particular type. Yeah. <laughs> That's really fascinating. Yeah. I, I guess the things we learn as we get older. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, yeah. Hopefully, as we get yeah. older, we keep learning. So it's a good well, thing. Very true. Yeah. And speaking of that, it's been a long time since we spoke, probably about four years now. <laughs> Yes, it has been a while. I mean, we've we've chatted, we've chatted. Uh, online, offline since then, but yeah, yeah. in Clubhouse. in this kind of a format, it has been a while. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So, I wanted to ask you, uh, you know, what you've been up to lately, first of all, but uh, I know when we when we were speaking, maybe it was I don't know if it was bef during our interview or whether it was um, during uh, Clubhouse or uh, something like that. But you were talking about sonic diversity mm -hmm. at that time. And I'm wondering where you are with that now. Yeah, that was um, that was an initiative that uh, Studio Resonate launched uh, for mm -hmm. any of the listeners who are not familiar with Studio Resonate. It's a in-house 
audio agency that works with all the brands that advertise on uh, the Sirius XM media channels. So that would be Sirius XM satellite radio. It could be anything in our podcast network, Pandora, the digital streaming service. Um, and we represent the digital ad inventory for SoundCloud. Uh, so that's uh, the organization that I work with. And uh, shortly into the pandemic with the murder of George Floyd, we were looking for how we could get involved in making a difference um, in a way that was authentic to who we were as individuals, but also in our commitment to DEI initiatives. And the thing that uh, resonated with us was this idea that we don't just see um, race. We don't just see diversity um, in any form. We also hear it. Uh, and what's the implications for that in advertising and marketing? So that started the journey. And I think, you know, when we last spoke, we were probably just getting into that. We, mm -hmm. you know, we wanted to look for research that could help us make a business case for brands leaning into more diversity in their uh, voice casting. Uh, and interestingly enough, there wasn't any that existed. There was a lot of research in advertising uh, around the impact of more diverse advertising from a visual standpoint. Maybe it touched on audio if it looked at uh, a, a spokesperson, but nothing that was really audio only or audio first. So we decided that's really where we needed to, to start because it's one thing to make a moral argument. It's another thing to try and convince brands from a business perspective that this is a, a practice that could actually help their brands. So we launched two studies, the first of their kind, looking at the way that we hear race and what the impact is uh, of that on ad favorability and effectiveness. And what we found, uh, the research is really fascinating, but we don't need to go into the to the weeds of, of that as much as I like to <laughs> as the nerdy science guy. What we found was, um, you know, not surprisingly in our general market advertising, if we're using diverse voices and in our, our initial study, we were concentrating specifically on black voices. If we're using black voices in our general market advertising, then that advertising is going to appeal more to black consumers. That's what we would expect. But we also found that in doing that, we didn't see any negative impacts of that on advertising to white consumers or other consumers that weren't uh, identifying with that particular demographic. And we felt like that was the beginning of the, of the business case. We live in a diverse world. Um, we we should be hearing diverse voices as i like to say if the only time we're hearing voices of color are in advertising to those segments uh, then we've not just segmented those voices we've actually segregated them so mm. let's let's lean into sonic diversity you'll uh you know create um, better representation and uh, a, a better relationship for your brands with those communities at the same time without uh, having any negative impacts on your ads favorability or effectiveness. So that's where we started. And we've since grown that into looking at not just the general market segments, but into the multicultural market segments themselves. Because the reality is, is these segments aren't monolithic. They don't all sound the same way. They also have different tonalities and timbres and dialects. Uh, and thinking about this specifically in our marketing to Latina and, and Latinas uh, populations, you know, how do we practice a little more diversity there leaning into Mexican accents, Puerto Rican accents, Dominican accents, Colombian accents, uh, again, in ways that can help in targeting, but also in ways that can introduce a, a bit of diversity into those segments. Uh, and then most recently, we've started to explore um, this idea of sonic diversity 
in in an age of AI. So what does this mean, you know, specifically? Yeah, as as we think about voice synthesis, mm -hmm. uh, and what's interesting here is how this has taken us um, into looking not only at race or ethnicity, but also gender in realizing that a lot of the technology has really been built on uh, some some gender biases, uh, wh whether it be early digital assistants were uh, heard as white and female, that's potentially problematic on two fronts. And then the way in which uh, the technology as it's been developed uh, predominantly by men and, and white males uh, has been built around uh, ways to, to make those voices more favorable. Uh, you know, not necessarily in an attempt to, uh, uh, you know, explicitly other uh, other populations, but even in our codex, there's been research when the Zoom codec and, you know, you've got to make sacrifices with bandwidth. But if you make sacrifices at frequencies that are typically where female voices live, then those voices don't sound as good. And there's been some research that seems to suggest that women um, on a Zoom platform aren't perceived as being as charismatic um, unless they lower the pitch of their their voices because it's more favorable to lower pitches than to, to higher pitch voices. So there's really, it's subtle, but it's something to think about. And we don't often think about diversity in the context of what we hear. And that's why we're exploring this. So got I'm off so on a bit true. of a tangent there, but no, it, it was I've been great... known to do that when I'm passionate about something. <laughs> it you, was you fantastic. You have a hard time shutting me up. So. <laughs> it's totally fine. That's what we're here for. I'm going to ask you questions and you can go uh, for I'm going to riff <laughs> and try not uh, yeah. to get into trouble. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I love that explanation about Zoom, actually. That's really interesting. And I know that uh, in the early days of the microphone, that was a problem, too. Yes. Right? The, the microphones themselves were built for male voices. They were not built for female voices. Yeah. And you think about, um, you know, the early days of radio. There was a, a, a great article in, um, I believe it was uh, The New Yorker on this very topic. And uh, they were making the point that... Uh, in the early days of telephone, where we had human operators on the other line, this is predominantly female operators. Uh, you know, part of that probably played into the the perception of females as being caring. The negative part of that may have been females being assistants. Um, but you would expect that with the rise of radio, that women with these you know, talking to the public a lot, being on uh, a microphone would be prime candidates to work in radio. But when the FCC needed to regulate bandwidth, again, this is another example of where you've got to make cuts uh, at certain frequency points to adapt to those bandwidth levels. And the decisions of what frequencies to cut um, wound up being, you know, leaving the frequencies in that work better with lower, more resonant voices that, you know, tend to be, um, you know, produced by men because of the way you know, the biology is with the vocal cords. Uh, and the result of that was, again, it wasn't favorable to female voices. And then there was another factor that played into it that a lot of the engineers, uh, you know, were kind of operating under this belief that, women's voices are are much softer uh and and so they would they okay. would tend to uh you know start with the volume up a little bit more and if a female voice wasn't that soft uh and projected then it overdrove the the amps uh, and so there was this perception that women just can't be good on radio because their voices are too harsh or yeah. they're, they're too shrill. nasal and too shrill. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. That's the word. Yeah. I mean, it's your lived experience. So you probably 
are familiar with some of these things. I was, you well, know. Yeah. Some uh, of yeah. it. I tend to have a lower voice. So for me, so it's helps, not yeah. as much of a yeah. <laughs> problem, but I definitely have spoken to people where it is a problem. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and I had this, yeah. uh, you know, I had this conversation today around this idea of the, the talk. Uh, you know, we, we have heard about this, um, in the, in the black community. Yes. You know, the, yeah. the talk that's given. Um, and this same idea uh, with black voice actors that uh, I've had conversations with because they've, you know, they've been in situations, unfortunately, where a director might say to them, could you sound a little less urban? Could you sound a little more urban? And we know what uh, yeah. that's code for, you yeah. know, and so it's it's these dialectical cues. And as a black voiceover artist, you learn how to lean into or lean out of those cues we would call it um code switching you know, yeah or style switching yeah, yeah. Uh, and i think there's the same thing um an, an entrainment w that you find with with females whether it be female leaders mm -hmm. or female voice artists or announcers where there's this idea of you know lowering my voice will give me the perception of more power, more authority, you know, and it's unfortunate that you can't show up as your authentic self, that there's kind of an aural mask, if you will, that you have to put on. And, and look, certainly there are other ways we experience this. I mean, it, as I mentioned, I grew up in rural West Virginia mm -hmm. uh, and my father was from Northern Ohio and we would go visit my uh, relatives there. And I noticed that they said Ohio much differently. You know, it, it wasn't Oha. Um, and as a child, I liked that Northern accent and I kind of adopted that. There are occasions where the South creeps in a little bit more. And yes, I've, I've been in voiceover sessions where um, there's this perception that any kind of a Southern twang might uh, come across as being undesirable. Maybe it's uneducated. Maybe it's not as sophisticated. So there are these biases that we all um, have to have to deal with. But I, in saying that, I do want to make sure that we don't confuse, uh, you know, that kind of a of a dialectical moment where somebody might say, hey, I heard a little bit of, of, of a twang. Can we dial that region out? That's much different than saying to a black voiceover artist, you know, essentially, can you sound less black? Yeah. Or can you sound Very more, more, yeah. <laughs> more black? There's there's a there's a, a prejudice there. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, I, I mean, I'm I'm not so I can't I don't have any direct experience there. I do have experience with the whole female voice thing. Sure. And yeah, that's um, that's that's a lot. <laughs> yeah, I think the biases we all have are a lot and hearing more diversity in the voices that we hear in our everyday lives is going to help with that. Right. And because the, the more used to things that are different that we get used to the more we hear it the more we get used to it and, exactly and the yeah. more familiar things are you know the science shows us the the more we tend to think of those things favorably or, or feel better about them and, the less we other them yeah exactly and i and yeah. i think that's uh, in light of the our stand for sonic diversity where we started and thinking about this in the context of ai mm -hmm. that's one of the things that we're trying to promote is to make sure that uh the synthetic voices that are being created um are diverse that that there are a lot of uh choices that we can have there that the um training uh populations that are used in developing these voices, that there's diversity there, um, that there is diversity systemically represented um, in the technology companies, um, the developers, the engineers that are creating these voices. Uh, 
and that we get clear in how we're representing them. You know, there are, there yeah. are digital avatars that are sometimes assigned to these voices. And if we're not careful, there are certain biases that can come to play there that, you know, where we, we get into colorism, the, the lightness or darkness of skin and what, what is that communicating, you know, or the voices that are served up regularly, you know, are, are we putting, putting the voices positioning them or delivering them in a way that it's favoring one voice over the other. And uh, look, this is this isn't, you know, an, a, an attempt to, uh, to 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 try and and create uh, a situation where no bias exists because that's impossible. But it, the extent to which we can mitigate bias and make sure that people are represented fairly, that they're treated fairly, that they're paid fairly, um, you know. We we at at Studio Resonate and SSM Media, we're interested in in AI. We're interested in what the technology can can do that can help us uh, creatively or help us, um, you know, with with efficiencies. But at the same time, we also want to be mindful of whether or not it's going to impact creative effectiveness in a negative way. Uh, what this means for our human voiceover talent in terms of their jobs and and their work. So all of these things are are, are important to us. So you know we want to make sure that we have an informed opinion and that we're making decisions with these things in mind. Uh, you know to to protect the folks that we work with, and also to protect our clients. You know, we don't want brands to get into a situation where, um, you know, they're, they're blindsided because there's things about the technology that they haven't thought about. Um, and they're, what kinds of things they're using would they, it. I, I'm curious, what kinds of things would they not well, have thought of that could maybe I mean, come up, do you think? Quest questions to ask, like, uh, mm -hmm. let's let's move away from voice. Let's talk about music. and, and Sure. Mm -hmm. AI generated music, um, uh, and I'll you know I'll limit to audio. We could get into visual, but let's say AI generated music. We talk about audio here. That's you know the, <laughs> it's all. I good. mean, there's there's a, a couple of new companies, uh, Udio and Sundo, that have mm -hmm. come out with um, m music AI systems that, quite honestly. I didn't think I thought it would be one to two years before we would get to where they are. And they're already there. I mean, these tools are really amazing. But we're now reaching out to um, some of the stock libraries that we use, you know, when we're producing spots, um, you know, when we're using music from uh, music libraries, asking them, are they incorporating AI? into some of their performance libraries mm -hmm. because until we get a handle on what the training sets are there's the potential that there could be copyright infringement yes and can you copyright a piece of music that's created with ai though well i am not a legal expert on this and i think as of right now um i i don't think the copyright is uh, in place where you can copyright that. There mm -hmm. is some question around, you know, if you own the software, do you own the output? Um, but if it is trained on copyrighted material, you know, this, this is where we can get in the weeds, but it, it gets really interesting. If you think about what's the process of human composition, you know, Certainly, we're borrowing from anything and and everything. Is there anything really new under the sun? You know, we could. Well, that's we could, kind of we why could, um, we could argue that. Yeah, like I remember back in the day when people would uh, not accept demo tapes from people because yes. they were afraid that they would get the, sued later the on blowback, if anything. The blowback, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Like if they happened to use something that was sort of from that demo, then they could get yes. sued later on. And, so. and and there have even been, you know, more recently controversial decisions in copyright that have set precedent. You think about the blurred lines, for instance, mm -hmm. and that 
uh, you know, some musicologists might listen to Blurred Lines and some of the Marvin Gaye material and say, well, you know, if we were looking at this legally in the, the letter of the law, there's no copyright infringement here. But because there was were interviews where the composers were talking about the inspiration that they took from Marvin Gaye, that was then argued, oh, well, this was intent. And now when you bring intent into that picture, it makes it even even cloudier. So that's why a, a lot of advertising agencies won't even want you to use the word sound alike. Mm, um, yeah. You know, they, they, they try to be very careful uh, about, you know, mentioning where inspiration is taken from. And again, as, as artists and composers, that's something that we normally do. But here's the thing that can happen in that process. If you're a composer working on a, a brand theme or a brand score, um, you may inadvertently copy a melody and not realize it. It's buried in your psyche. That may come to light and there may be legal ramifications for that. And, you know, brands need to work around that. That's why there's indemnification clauses a lot of times when you're working with, with music houses. Um, and a similar thing can happen with AI if you're using copyrighted materials in the training sets. So the AI could be drawing from a, a, a phrase and there may be a way to document that it drew from a particular phrase and that violates copyright. And, you know, what happens in a world when AI has done that and not a human? What, what are the legal recourses and ramifications. Yeah, so these are the things that, yet. yeah, these are the things that, uh, you know, we have to deal with. The other thing that um, companies may not think about is what are uh, potential biases um, against the use of AI in advertising or creativity from a consumer perspective. Um, and these can point. be these can be really subtle. And look, over time, as we normalize the use of AI, some of these biases may may dissipate. But we found, interestingly, in our, our research, we did some research around um, human and AI voices. So this was neuro-based research so that we could kind of get at what was going on with subconscious. And the things we found that were really interesting were that uh, if we ask people if they could tell the difference, thought they could tell the difference between an AI and a human voice, the majority of them said, yes, we could tell a difference. But when we tested it, it was a flip of a coin whether or not they'd get it right. Uh, and the AI voices have improved even since we did that test. So it's getting harder and harder to tell the difference. So then we wanted to test... Um, something called implicit react, uh, implicit attraction. So how attractive something is, you know, uh, on a, on a subconscious level. And we looked at two factors there specifically trust and positivity. And what we found when we looked at synthetic voices, uh, in ads in different categories was that trust and positivity, um, scored well for AI voices. It's not that when people heard them, there was something that made them not trust them or something that made them feel like they didn't have a positive reaction. So from a commercial standpoint, could you use an AI synthetic voice in an ad and it be an effective ad? Probably. But when we compared trust and positivity in human voices, it was significantly higher for a human voice. And again, remember, the panelists had a hard time telling what was human and and not human. Sure. But consistently, we found the human voices were scoring higher on these two levels. 
where this, the study got really interesting to me was we wanted to look at this idea that maybe we would get to a world where you would have to disclose if you were using AI. So let's say you had to disclose if there was an AI voice in your commercial. So we primed listeners before they heard the commercial by saying you're about to hear a commercial that's voiced by uh, AI synthesis and then played the commercial and then looked at um, their kind of subconscious reaction to it. And we found in those conditions that while there wasn't a significant fall off, the positivity and trust in the AI voices definitely trended downward. Where it got really interesting was sometimes we played human voices and told panelists they were listening to an AI voice. And it still went down, huh? But yes, when we did that. In fact, yeah. the human voices trust significantly dropped to where it was basically on par with the synthetic voices. So, you know, whether or not someone would say we don't like AI or, you know, say we're not biased with AI voices, our research tends to suggest that somehow there's a bias at play. And again, over time, as this gets normalized, it may go away. But these are things that um, you know, brands may not be thinking about in a, a yeah. rush towards efficiency and optimization. And again, we're not anti those things. In fact, we want those as much as anybody else does too. Mm -hmm. But we also want to make sure that, you know, our ads are being creatively effective. So we want to be mindful and thoughtful about how we're incorporating AI into our creative workflow and, and mitigate for these issues of brand safety, for um, ad uh, effectiveness, uh, and for these biases that could have halo effects um, on the brands themselves. So these are all, you know, subtle things, but it's sometimes the subtle things that can make the difference in consumer perception and behavior towards a brand. And, you know, we, we want to be careful with those things for our clients. Oh, totally. Yeah. It, it sounds like people just want to not be lied to. <laughs> I, yeah. At the end of the day, and, and, you know, we were just talking about trust and, and that's, yeah. and that's what it is. Uh, you know, I, I, I think, uh, and it's, you know, unfortunately we're living in a world where these tools are making it harder to know what's real and what's not real. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, in, in our brain's effort um, to reduce the noise, because we're still basically wired for fight or flight, all our brains are trying to do every day is help us survive. You know, we, we may have, have gotten more sophisticated in how we think, yeah. um, but emotionally, which is really the driver for us, we haven't changed much in millions of years. And so in the brain's attempt to conserve its energy um, as things get more and more normalized, uh, you know, it's, it's harder to continually ask the questions. I just read something. Where did that come from? I just saw something. Where did that come from? I just heard something. Where did that come from? It's easier to start from the default of, you know, I can believe that to the default of, I don't want to trust anything. In fact, you know, as, as psychologists, we would say somebody that lives in that condition lives in a condition of paranoia, but mm -hmm. you know, maybe, yeah. well, maybe it's, it's going to flip and, you know, being, I mean, being paranoid days, is going to work in your, right? in your yeah. favor. <laughs> I don't know. Well, that's the end of this episode. Thanks for listening. And if you like what you heard, why not tell a friend about this podcast? It's available in all the usual locations. Until next time.